Our theme for the day is Tomorrow's Talent Today, which is about you and your role in the future of the search profession. It's also about identifying tomorrow's talent for today's search assignments. But it's also about building your pipeline for those searches that you'll be doing tomorrow, a year from now, and beyond. The ASC partners with 50 of the world's top executive MBA programs to provide executive level career resources to their students and alumni for the ASC Blue Step Services for candidates. I'm pleased to introduce the following session, Next Level Leadership, Cultivating the 21st Century Executive. We have with us today a special guest, Mark Horniff, Assistant Dean of the Career Leadership Institute and Executive MBA Career Management at Columbia Business School, in conversation with Peter Felix, ASC President and CEO. I'll turn it over to Mark and Peter to discuss 21st century leadership challenges and what that means to you as a search professional. Thanks, uh, Toby. Everyone hear me? Well, uh, this is a, a rare opportunity and one that um, uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to moderate. Uh, Mark is a good friend of the uh, AESC. Uh, we have over a number of years developed relationships, as Toby said, with leading business schools around the world. Uh, but Columbia has been very close to us, um, physically and uh, relationship-wise. Uh, we've held a number of events uh, at Columbia, face-to-face uh, -face events with uh, graduates of the MBA and the EMBA programs um, about career management, um, etc., and also, of course, the role of executive search in career management. Now, from your point of view, clearly, uh, what's happening to the talent pool is, is critically important. The perspective for you is important in terms of uh, the, the uh, very many aspects of um, influence on the talent pool. Generational, uh, demographic, global, etc. So for you, the talent pool doesn't stay static. For the business schools, it doesn't stay static either. And their role is, of course, to help develop the talent pool for the future. So the business schools, both at MBA and EMBA level, are looking to help develop future leaders. So I think our, our discussion today is really going to focus on what are the dynamics of the changing environment, um, how does the business school play a role, um, and what does it mean to you when you're looking for talent uh, for the future. So, Mark, uh, what do you see as the challenges that face 21st century executives? Um, dynamics of that changing environment, uh, skills, um, the kinds of challenges they're going to face. What do you see from a business school point of view? Where do we begin? <laughs> uh, we only have an hour, right? So uh, we'll, we'll just scratch the surface. And, and there are so many that um, I think it, we, we probably think about them in, in sort of the most prominent uh, challenges or dynamics that we see. Um, one being the growth in emerging markets, um, which you're all uh, familiar with. I mean, the, the, the fact that emerging markets are going to be contributing more to uh, global economic growth than, the, than developed ones going forward into the future, um, and then a significant uh, portion of the global Fortune 500 will be uh, based in, in other markets has real implications for uh, future executives and leaders and organizations developed markets. Um, and, you know, the emergence of billions of consumers and the power that gives those markets to compete is something that, that executives and leaders uh, certainly are paying attention to now and will continue to have to do in the future. Uh, you know, and I think that, that also this, this idea that leaders need to be more culturally competent, um, and I can't remember which CEO coined this phrase, but this sense of uh, global empathy, which is a real sensitivity to cultures and countries uh, outside of, of the developed world, um, the developed world, is going to become increasingly important. So that's one, certainly one big dynamic, and, and people at business school are talking about that all the time. It sort of runs through the curriculum. The other that is certainly a surprise is the, the pace of, of technological change. Um, what is, what is the, the, the number every 18 months computing power doubles in terms of speed and, and uh, storage power? And that creates a lot of issues, not just in, in terms of reshaping manufacturing or increasing the level of connectivity uh, between uh, businesses and stakeholders, but a bunch of issues come up uh, surrounding that. Information flows are just enormous, and the, the management of that data and information is going to continue to be a, a 
a challenge for organizations, as well as disruptive technologies. I mean, when you think about the fact that um, it's really easy for businesses now as things get cheaper and, and speed and computing power increases for entrepreneurial organizations to start up and scale, that presents a real competitive problem that, that obviously leaders are going to have to pay attention to. Decision making has to be much quicker. Um, not just about technology, but the speed at which the information flows and come in means that executives are going to have to continue to get used to making decisions more quickly uh, and to leverage data more effectively than they, than they do currently. Um, I also think when you're, when you're thinking about talent, um, I wouldn't say that it means that you need to be looking for executives that are technological experts. But, but more so people that are, are facile with both the nuts and bolts of managing technology infrastructure and also the strategy around technology. Um, or, or very good at hiring that skill set and managing it. One interesting uh, trend that, that we pay attention to is the extent to which um, knowledge workers are starting to be displaced by smart technologies. So, so roles where pattern recognition is part of the, the work these are things that, that machines, uh, smart machines and, and software can do much more efficiently. I was reading the other day about Google and the fact that Google uh, was able to map every business, uh, residence, and street number in France, the entirety of France, in an hour, which is remarkable when you consider that um, in human terms that would have taken a team of several hundred people probably months to do. So it's those kinds of uh, developments that we really need to be paying attention to. And I think executives who are going to be leading organizations in the future are really going to have to deal with it in a much more significant way. I was reading this morning that KKR just made a $55 million investment in a German um, uh, artificial intelligence fund. So we're going to continue to see developments on this front where organizations are going to be looking for ways to, to leverage technology to replace knowledge workers. I will also add in that up at Columbia, some of you may be aware that the university is building a new campus um, which sits north of 125th Street. It goes from basically broadly over to the river for several months. The first building that's going up there is the Mind Brain Behavior Institute, which is a Jerome Green funded initiative. And it'll house the largest concentration of neuroscientists eventually in the Western Hemisphere. And you see a sort of convergence of all disciplines in the university around the science of the brain. I think that's going to continue to be an issue. We anticipate that it's going to have an impact certainly on performance management eventually. If we can map the brain, we can see how decisions in real time are effective or not effective, what parts of the brain are being used in order to make those decisions. And that's a little scary when you think about it. But also from a, from a hiring perspective, imagine the, the information that might give you eventually as you're looking to consider an executive for a new position. You can actually have real data about how does this person make decisions, in what situations do they make good decisions, and in what situations do they make bad decisions. And it's fascinating. fascinating. So, uh, the third uh, trend that we pay attention to is what, what Peter alluded to earlier, which is the shift in, in talent demographics. And, and when we think when we think about um, the aging population across the world, I was reading the other day that in the, in the coming decades, up to 2 billion workers are going to be out of the workforce. And we all know that in the US, we're literally replacing 77 million workers with about 44 million. Um, that's, that's a very scary statistic. And so any, any executive now and going forward is going to have to be very adept at identifying talent and, and hiring. But not only that, I think, um, being willing to groom and promote younger workers earlier on, it's going to be a big, a big issue because there simply won't be enough bodies or brains to, to fill out the talent pool. So those are sort of big bucket trends. I mean, there, there are plenty of others. Uh, obviously, economic volatility, natural events, I mean, this whole Ebola uh, scare has, has mean a little frantic, I'll be honest with you, and I think it's hard to know how things like this will impact the economy. When we think about the disruption, the potential disruption to the transportation system alone, how do, how do businesses conduct business regularly if these things are going on and they're not predictable and they sometimes can't be controlled in a way that we'd like? 
Um, I think, to coin a, a military phrase, we live in a VUCA world. I don't know how many of you have heard this term. But things are increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And so, broadly speaking, I think what that means in terms of, of hiring and assessing talent is that you want to want to look for people who are comfortable, maybe a not the right word, but able to or adept at operating in that kind of environment, and, and not everybody is. Um, when we think about this in terms of management from the past, you know what's really different about today's um, organizations or today's leaders and what they face. You know, one, we talked about this the other day, that that traditional top-down command and control structure just doesn't seem to work as much anymore. Maybe for some organizations, but given the, the new generations of workers that are coming in, that's not appealing uh, to, the, to the broad talent pool as much. Plus, problems are so complex that um, you're almost forced as a, as a leader or as an executive to distribute uh, decision-making power across the organization. Otherwise, um, you run the risk of, of making bad decisions in, in a short amount of time. The speed, I think, at which things are happening is, is no surprise to anybody. Uh, it's just really overwhelming. And, and so, given that level of uncertainty, given the ambiguity, finding executives, finding leaders who can really handle that emotionally and um, are able to make decisions without complete information and, and, and be comfortable with that, but at the same time, leveraging the complementary skills around them, I think, is going to be increasingly and that's, people talk a lot about that at that point. Made your job a bit more difficult, doesn't it? <laughs> 30 years ago, none of this existed. The world was far more certain. Uh, those in the security business talk with fondness about the Cold War. Why? Because you knew who the enemy was, so to speak. And it was a bilateral deal. There wasn't any ambiguity there was certainty, the relationships were relatively clear, difficult, but nevertheless, you knew what you were dealing with. Sadly, um, or perhaps interestingly today, uh, there are so many different facets of the world environment that affect, exactly as Mark said, um, all issues associated with recruitment. This is the great thing about recruitment, and I think Josh mentioned it earlier. It touches so many aspects of life. It touches economic development, social development, cultural issues, um, and, and it's like a huge jigsaw puzzle, but the jigsaw puzzle has become far more complex. So juggling these issues, certainly from a research point of view, um, is, is very challenging. But it's no more challenging for you than it is for the client. So in the world of challenge and ambiguity and uncertainty and all the things that Marx mentioned, you know, it's a bit like uh, that, that phrase, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Well, you're the one-eyed man. You've got to be that bit cleverer, or that bit more aware of what's going on. And then you add some value. So if you can talk, talk the talk, with the client about these issues, you're already ahead of the game, because they realize that uh, you understand the difficulty, you understand the complexity, you understand the ambiguity. Therefore, you're a good partner to help them solve what could be an intractable, there's always a solution. It may be intractable, but it, it's, there's always a solution somewhere. But this issue of the talent shortage is critically important. And uh, what I'd like to ask Mark, I mean, that's 77, this is just the United States, and there's demographic shift in other markets too, that I'm sure you're aware of. But as the baby boomers start to retire, it's like a kind of series of waves that are getting bigger and bigger. And, and it's happening now, right now, with large numbers of people retiring out of the workforce. What does that mean? It means that the succeeding generation, there's a great shortage in the succeeding generation of talent to go around. Now, okay, the job environment's changed, more productivity from technology and so on and so on, but, and the jobs aren't the same. But nevertheless, you can't hide away from a demographic shift in the United States of 77 to 44 million. So what does that mean? It means, as Mark has again said, that talent has got to be identified earlier, it's got to be made more experienced earlier, individuals have to manage their careers more dynamically, faster, in order to be ready when the call comes, and the call may well come from you. So instead of the call coming to the 48-year-old 
it may well come to the 35 year old. Are you experienced enough to be the chief executive of this division or whatever? Now how are you going to assess that? How are you going to assess the talent at that earlier level? Because you don't have the ease of looking at that resume and say, oh well, it's obvious. It's obvious, you know, this person's ready. That person may not be ready. So how do you assess that? So Mark, what are the business schools doing to address that? How are you fast tracking the talent that's going to be needed for this next wave of demand? Happy to happy to comment on that, but I'll also say that anytime you're looking for talent, we're right up town. <laughs> so feel free to, to give me a call. I'll be happy to talk with you about that. The, the Columbia's perspective on, on developing that talent, I think, is probably similar to most of our peer schools. And it's a combination of classroom learning and experiential learning. So, and that's done with a theory to practice approach. That's the layer over top of all of this because I think there's a clear recognition these days in the top schools that's not enough just to deliver knowledge in the classroom. Students have to be building skills in real time, practicing those skills in order to be able to accelerate when they get out into the workforce or if they're an executive MBA, which is the population I work with, um, to leverage those developing skills in real time as they're, as they're attending. So, in the classroom, um, the core curriculum, which is the sort of required coursework that, that MBAs and executive MBAs take, at Columbia is really, it really focuses on teaching students to think integratively around business problems. And there's a common case that's taught, it's actually a GM case, which is looked at in every class uh, from the angle of that discipline. So whether it's accounting, marketing, finance, econ, strategy, it doesn't matter. Um, everyone is looking at the case from that perspective and then integrating the learnings from that um, into a final project so that students get to see the bigger picture around what is this very significant uh, business event in our, in our country. Um, what does that mean in terms of being uh, an executive? How, how would I have dealt with this problem? Um, what, what do I need to be thinking about as I go out into the workforce and avoiding uh, situations like change? So, and so the, the core curriculum is very much taught in an integrated way. Electives um, can be much more specific. They can drill down into a specific industry or, or functional discipline. Um, and, and they may be as specific as um, applied value investing, or they may be broad based. I mean, uh, Bruce Greenwald and Joe Stiglitz teach one of the most popular courses in Columbia, which is a um, globalization in markets and, and economic development course, which is several hundred students sign up for this every time they teach it. We also teach master classes, and master classes are really designed around putting teams of students together so that they can actually work on a real business problem with the company. So the faculty connect with executives in, in the marketplace, identify problems to be worked on, and then put teams of students together within that faculty member's discipline. So an example would be Bill Duggan, one of our great faculty members, teaches a strategic intuition course, and he has, as a master class, a strategic intuition consulting lab, which is sort of teaches a research-based way of looking at business problems from a strategy point of view, and then they actually go and solve problems. That's the whole class. So there's a heavy, heavy practice emphasis woven in uh, to the curriculum, which I don't think was there a couple of decades ago. It's really become a, a big, a big focus in the school. Other ways that we do this is, is simply put students in, in uh, markets around the world. We do international study trips. EMBAs will go travel to another country for a week and take an entire course in that market. And a faculty member is someone who's typically familiar with that local market and can link whatever discipline they're covering to uh, a global uh, perspective. And then, broadly speaking, and I think this is happening at the university level too, there's a lot of integration of cross teaching. So we have a lot of management psychologists, people who teach undergrad psychology who are also teaching courses in the business school. Our decision risk and operations professors also teach in the engineering program. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary teaching and thinking going on, all of which I think Peter is designed to um, encourage students to think in an integrated way. The business schools used to be um, somewhat theoretical. Uh, how are you um, responding to that? To what extent are you trying to teach management techniques, management disciplines, communication skills, personnel, management, that kind of thing? Certainly it's it's addressed in coursework. Um, from a theoretical point of view, and to some extent, there is practice opportunities. So 
an example would be in the core leadership course that the embas take it's a required class Paul Ingram who's a professor who teaches that class talks a lot about collaboration flexibility adaptability and will run students through improv exercises which isn't something that was done five or ten years ago in business school at least not as part of the formal curriculum but it's designed to really give them an opportunity to practice in class we will then complement that where we can outside of the curriculum in the Career Management Center and in other departments of the school by offering practice opportunities. Those could be workshops. We did an improv workshop this summer that was designed to amplify what I just described. So taking EMBA students, running them through a series of improv exercises, chunking those and then debriefing each set and saying, how does this link back to leader capabilities that are covered in that core curriculum? So if we're really interested in collaboration or team skills, if we're interested in influence, how can we use these kinds of practice exercises to further develop those skills? And, and I think this is a, a generalization that a lot of MBAs, MBAs in particular, are very hungry for that these days. They're not interested in coming and, and passively receiving knowledge anymore. Um, they want the opportunity to practice skills and develop skills. And we did this this improv workshop and immediately following one of the members raised his hand and said, how do we make this more complicated? How can we make this, uh, you know, take this to the next level? So I think a lot of that is gonna, gonna continue to go on, certainly in Columbia. We also invite speakers of all sorts in, um, and they range from recent alumni all the way up to uh, C-suite professionals who will come in and talk about business problems and issues they're facing Inevitably, it's a global um, issue that, that an organization is, is focused on. And that's another way that we bring an outside perspective that, that I think helps to foster this idea that it's not just about going to class and, and uh, doing your homework. It's really about being more broadly minded and practicing the skills that the faculty are teaching and they're, they're communicating. How many people here have an MBA? Just one? They are recruiting. Happy to talk about that too. <laughs> um, do you, in fact, um, you know, one of one of the, the challenges that researchers, consultants face is this is this whole issue of assessment. How good really is this person, given a, a, a range of, of skills that you hope they will have, that the spec will say we need communication, all kinds of things. You know, we we all know how to write job specs, right? You know, it's, it's all in there. <coughs> they will look the, the mic after the one. Um, you know, uh, Superman, but or Superwoman, but really, um, you know, sometimes they're a bit empty. Those those criteria. How do we really know? Um, how do you know? What do you do at the end of your MBA courses or your Ember courses to assess people? It's a tough question to answer. We're all aware that there are formal assessments out there. And I, I tend to think that given that, that VUCA world that I uh, referenced, how do you spell that? VUCA. Volatility, uncertainty. Anyone heard of it? Complexity and ambiguity. Yeah. So it comes from the military, actually. Okay. Um, that it's, it's perfectly fair to us use formal assessments, absolutely. Mm. Um, I would say that the personal interview is still probably the most used in the end, at least that's our experience in, in advising and coaching students when we hear from them. Um, although behavioral interviewing is, is pretty much the norm now, um, when we prepare them to go out to position for new roles, we spend a lot of time helping them develop war stories. Here's an example of when I exhibited X skill, or here's my capability around this trait and developing multiple stories. And so I think you know, to, our, to our discussion earlier about the, the dynamics and the sort of trends and, and how complex and ambiguous the world is, having a conversation with candidates about, you know, tell me, show me where your, your demonstrated success is in dealing with it, or um, how have you bounced back from failure? And I, you know, everybody asks that question, like that. Tell, me about a, tell me about a failure, um, which is much less interesting than what did you do about it? If you failed, how easily were you able to, to rebound, which speaks to resilience, which speaks to some of the, some of the, the capabilities that are 
are much harder to assess on formal assessment. Mm -hmm. Because to a certain extent, um, I mean, we all want shortcuts. Um, and if you're a, in the research world, there's a huge amount of information out there. And LinkedIn hasn't helped in that respect, really, has it? Hasn't it made it a little more difficult? There's so much information. Now you've got to work out, you know, really who are the best people. But one of the things we're looking for often is a seal of approval. They work for IBM. They work for Citibank. Oh my gosh, they got the Columbia MBA. What's the value of that seal of approval in the assessment process that these guys are having to make? Depends on who you ask. Uh, I, I certainly am, am biased, I, I have to admit. I think um, those credentials are helpful as a baseline, just as financial acumen, analytical, strategic thinking, um, executive presence, communication skills, uh, strong sense of ethics. I, I think that that's the expected baseline. Um, so I think to some extent those, those are helpful benchmarks, but beyond that, getting a sense of, of how the executive or how the candidate plays in their organization. Um, where have they delivered in that? That's quantifiable. And, and ask that question. Show us, demonstrate the impact that you have. Um, where have they developed talent? Does this person have a capacity for developing people? And that's another incredibly important skill that, that probably wasn't top of mind for a lot of executives a decade or so ago, but now it's going to the talent shortage sets in. Um, so, to some extent, credentials um, are a stamp that say this person has has passed a screening process of some sorts. But I think these days it's probably a baseline. By the way, do start thinking about questions that you might like to ask, because uh, we don't want a pregnant silence when I start asking <laughs> questions. Uh, I think this is really um, important because this link between the talent shortage, the fast tracking of candidates, the ability to identify talent, um, not easily, but knowing how to identify talent, and particularly talent that, uh, as you say, can deal with ambiguity and so on, because we're not looking at the traditional corporate structures anymore. There are very few people going forward who probably will spend the whole career with Citibank, the whole career with IBM. So. It, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, how do you make these assessments? Um, will they fit into another organization of different size, different culture? One of the biggest issues that executive recruiters, executive search firms face is the stick rate. It's the culture rejection, or it's the, the functional rejection. Not re It's rarely the functional rejection, it's normally the culture rejection. So how do you improve that? How do you uh, get your hands around, your heads around that challenge? Um, I don't think you necessarily have the answer to that, Mark, but any comments you have about that? Certainly. Uh, if you find a candidate that has a history of parachuting into different situations, um, whether they be different organizations, different functional verticals, different cultures, for sure, and can demonstrate how they've added value and adapted quickly, I think that's a pretty good sign of somebody who may be a good, adaptable, cultural fit. Um, nothing is foolproof, though. Nothing is foolproof. I think until, until the, the executive has a chance to go and play in, in the actual organization, it's very hard to know how successful that's going to I would agree with that. I mean, with your Ember programs, you're probably seeing um, some degree of, of flow from the major corporations. What are you seeing in terms of cultural change? Are you seeing a different type of person coming out of Honeywell or whatever it is today? You know, not as against 30 years ago, but you see what, what trends are you seeing there? Well, certainly you alluded to this earlier, Peter, the sense that, that careers are no longer linear, mm -hmm. that it's not a lockstep move up the ladder. Many people are thinking dynamically about, well, I've had some of this experience here, it'd be interesting to go over here and try this different functional vertical, or to move entirely out of my, my industry. We have in our program 
seen as, as many other programs have a, a decline in corporate sponsorship over the years, particularly as the financial crisis set in. Mm -hmm. That hasn't rebounded. And so we're now below 50% corporate sponsor, which means so many more of our students are coming in with a recruitment mindset. And they're looking for a change. But well, also with an investment mindset. Absolutely. Because it's not exactly inexpensive. Exactly. The other thing I would, I would say that we're seeing is um, increasingly students coming in, even if they come from a very uh, corporate experience, looking to work entrepreneurially. They may not have an idea for a startup. They may think they want to work for uh, a growth company. They may want to work in that kind of environment. They fantasize about what that would be like. Um, at the very least, they're looking to work intrapreneurially within a more formal structure. And so. I think it's, as you're assessing talent, that's something that might emerge. I'm, I'm not sure how many candidates would admit that, mm -hmm. openly, but but it speaks to a desire for and perhaps a capacity for innovation. Yeah, I think again, this is really interesting because you know if you, you take each era, you take the internet era, it was all what motivated you in your career if you were a senior executive. I wanted to I want to run an internet startup. It was <coughs> Um, the next generation, it's private equity. I want out of the corporate structure. I want into a more less structured environment where I can get a slice of the equity and make uh, make my fortune. Uh, I don't know what the current um, desire is. Uh, maybe just to you know, if you was keep your job actually for the last five years. Um, I think there's more mobility now. Perhaps you know, show me something interesting, and maybe I'll think about it. Um, but I think uh, you know it's really interesting that it, there should be far more people investing in their careers at mid-career. I find that really fascinating. So uh, a feeling that you know the corporate uh, environment is not providing the career I want. So how do they do this, Mark? Do they leave the company and then do the course, or do they get agreement from the company that they will do it uh, part time? Um, but surely, then that's a flag to the, the company that you know they're paying for it themselves, and that means they're going to be out of here. So how do you deal with that? It's a range, actually. Um, we a few years ago launched in what we call the Empath Saturday program. And this is designed for people who don't want to have to take any time off from work while they are in the Yet those people are very intense. Imagine going to school every Saturday for 23 months while you're working full time. It's a bit, it's a bit challenging. Um, interestingly, and this is anecdotal, um, a good number of those people have not even told their organizations they're earning money, which would have been unthinkable a decade ago. Right? I mean, a decade ago, a lot of organizations were sponsoring them, but they're seeing this as a as a tool that they're going to acquire, and they're absolutely thinking about making some sort of change, and they see a risk in informing their boss. the The traditional line of thinking was. Even if you're paying for it yourself, you want to go and sell this, you need a sponsor internally. Even if it's just for the time you're going to spend, because most of our program formats require taking some time off. From you. Our global students actually take block weeks off from you. They do it. You know, they take three or four days at a time and study at either our campus or other business school or university in Hong Kong. Um, but traditional thinking was you really need to, do, to cultivate a sponsor within the organization who's going to say, this is a good idea. This is why, here's what we're hoping to get out of this. And, and if the student's doing a, a good job of it, I think they're providing real-time feedback to their organization, to their, to their manager specifically, about what they're learning and how they're applying it. But we do see fatigue setting uh, for a lot of students. They hit second or third mm -hmm. semester, and even if their manager was a sponsor, or even if there's a senior person in the organization who said, I got my MBA, this is a great idea, I think you should too. They go to take time off from work, and the manager says, really, again, you have to go? You're not going to be here next week? So it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a real challenge. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to continue to see a trend towards people who are doing this for very personal reasons, because they're imagining a change at mm -hmm. some point, and they're not necessarily telling the organizations. When people come out of the MBA, let's talk about MBA first, uh, how much are the corporations recruiting at the business school still? By virtue of our, our 
location. We still have a pretty robust on-campus recruiting process, and I would say probably better than 50% of the full-time students go through that process. Mm -hmm. And the, the hirers tend to be those traditional high-volume MBA organizations, so um, investment banks, asset management firms, consulting firms. Consulting is actually the biggest one right now in Columbia. So it's, it's fairly robust. And, and the need for talent at that entry, we call it entry level or associate level, is still pretty pretty predictable you know, for the most part. They, they still tell us in April before fall recruiting how many schedules they'd like, when they want to come, um, and they have an idea about how many hires they want to make. So that's that's still fairly consistent. So consulting is quite a good barometer for you of your demand. Yes. Um, so would you say uh, that during the financial crisis, uh, has consulting been the most popular? Yes. Financial services kind of tanked or? I don't know that it's tanked. We still see a good number of students that go to financial services broadly. Um, the number of, of folks going into investment banking has decreased, mm. but there's still strong interest. And in, I think we probably have fewer shoppers, people who go in and say, I'm going to do this for a couple of years mm. and get it on the resume and make some money and then mm. go off and do something else. I mean, really, management consulting has a very good track record over the years, isn't it? Yes. In terms of providing talent. Um, well, there's always that issue about moving from the, you know, the advisory to the line. But the track record is pretty amazing. Um, a McKinsey or a Booz or a BCG, if you look at their alumni books, do you look at their alumni books? No. <laughs> Can you get access to those in your I wonder. I'm used to. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> the track record's terrific, I and mean, there is a talent bank. So that's still happening. It is, and, and I, yeah. the, the sell is still, you can come in, most of the strategy firms hire into a generalist degree, it's not a specialization. Right. And so you get this great broad exposure, multi-sector exposure, that really... Um, it's huge. It's huge in terms of putting you in front of different types of organizations, different types of leaders and managers, mm -hmm. and really giving you time to think through, if I'm going to get out of this at some point, where do I want to go? And I think building the confidence, the communication skills are essential, analytical, I mean, it's really it's very good training. So really the MBA plus management consulting is not bad, is it? It's a, a place to find, a find new talent. And I would say that our, our executive MBAs, um, and we do track this mm -hmm. uh, internally, that's the, the number one target space. What about the Embers? Where that is Embers for Embers. Oh, Embers well. Yeah. Really? So Embers are going into, into consulting? They would like to. They would like to. Because I, I would have thought they were a little long in the tooth to go into consulting. They, they are a bit long in the tooth. It's, it's not quite as difficult. If you're, if you're over 30, uh, getting a, a job on the sell side bank is going to be pretty challenging. Mm. Um, I think consulting firms are a bit more flexible in how they assess talent. Have a, a few every year, uh, and those who graduate and make some headway at the experience level. So non first year associate consultant level, but associate plus, if you will. Right. Usually, those people have some sort of expertise that the firms are looking for. So, an example is um, a few years ago, we had a student on Emma Global program who was an emergency room physician in London, and had a friend who was a partner in McKinsey's London firm, London office introduced him to his colleagues, that started a series of conversations, and, and about a year after graduation, we then transitioned to, to an associate of How old was he of being? As I recall, he was probably in his early to mid um, So I think, they're, I think they're willing to look at the town. Most executive MBAs who want to make that transition don't have prior consulting experience. So there isn't a summer internship sort of stamp of approval or a vetting process, and they end up uh, electing to go through the campus recruiting process. They can qualify to do that with the full-time students. But it's often a, a process of trying to retrofit to what the full-time profile looks like. So you can imagine a 30-plus year old executive with significant experience coming in. They may be every bit as smart, if not smarter, than a full-time MBA, but the risk problem is entirely different because the stamina required and the risk that they take because with the class of associates that comes in, we all know, uh, few are going to be part of it. So if that's the ambition, the risk uh, inherent in hiring that person and whether or not they'll stick is significant to the firm. If they don't stay for, for two or three or four years, they're probably not going to be running back. 
Okay. Are there any questions that anyone has um, already developed? We'll carry on talking if you haven't, but I do hope you'll come up with some. Anyone? Yes. Please. And so I would be curious as to your argument to your organization about getting an MBA. I mean, you know, obviously not not all of us here or very few of us have our MBAs. So are you okay without an MBA? I mean, what are what are the advantages and how can you make that argument? Um, I'd say it, it depends on, on what you're targeting. Um, there are certain industries, I wouldn't say it's a prerequisite, but certainly Consulting is a perfect example. If you're going to work in one of the, the sell side of the <coughs> in Wall Street, a lot of MBAs there. I I'm fairly pragmatic in how I think about this. If it's if it's really necessary, if you've done your due diligence in your target space, and your target space is telling you this is something that you really need, you need that analytical toolkit, you need that way of thinking integratively, um, you need that, that that business school mindset, then it's a great investment. Um, I wouldn't advocate pursuing it just because you feel like you want the credential. Um, it certainly can open some doors, but in the end it's a credential. It's not ultimately what's going to get you the opportunity. I think the, the, the thing that we, we tell the students, both MBAs and full-time students, is that the most valuable tool that you, you gain when you get your MBA is the network. It's a community of, of business folks around the world that will be with you for life. And you just never know when that's going to pay dividends. These are future colleagues, future bosses, future investors, partners. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an investment in a, in a set of relationships. Thank you. Well, what I personally found when I, I did, in fact, take an MBA, I'm afraid it was not Columbia. I can't mention where I actually went. Um, but um, what I found for myself and for others was that it presented a very credible, uh, realistic platform for change. So you were, say you were in marketing, um, or you were in engineering, a lot of engineers go to business school. It enabled you to uh, look at a range of options when you graduated and get exposure to the other disciplines, which you may well not have had if you had spent four, maybe five years in a corporation. There just wasn't time to give you exposure to everything. So. It, it's a, it's a, a very kind of condensed way of getting a lot of exposure, giving yourself a credible platform for change, and rethinking where you want, where, where you may want to go on. I also say that it, it opens up a lot of new ideas about where you could come from. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there, there is a theory to practice mindset, we have a number of um, academic research centers that are sort of the hub connecting research that's going on at the school with the marketplace. There's so many interesting things happening, there are events, programs. So a lot of students come in thinking, I'm going to be moving in this direction. And they get exposed to that community, and it shifts their thinking. And they start coming up with all sorts of ideas about what, what else they might do. And so in that sense, it's really a, it exposes you to a, a great array of opportunities that you might follow. Any other questions at the moment? Yes. Do you find that there's a disadvantage with getting an executive MBA versus a regular MBA? Well, you, I'm totally biased in this regard. I, I actually went through the full-time MBA program at Columbia, so I have the, the experience of being a student in the full-time program, but having worked with the executive MBAs for about eight years now, I would, if I had to do it all over again, I would have done them. Because there's no substitute for that real-time application of what you're learning in class. And that's something that was, I wouldn't say it was missing totally from my experience, but it wasn't even on my radar when I, when I did it. So I think it's an incredible experience. Um, I think the, the ability to take what you're learning in class and apply it in real time is, is very valuable. It's valuable to organizations. I would encourage a lot, plenty of organizations to consider it as a way to develop talent, um, even though there is a risk to, to the talent they need. Most of them are aware of that too. Um, some of our students come in interestingly, and they, when they start looking at the hiring marketplace, they say, "Well, I'm a little concerned because isn't the isn't the MBA like MBA light? It's sort of you know um, the, the sugar-free version of, of the MBA." 
And, and nothing could be further from the truth. When you consider the fact that these people are working full time, they're earning the same degree. So it's really, it's not an MBA, it's an MBA. And they're doing it in a program format that requires them to compress all of their class time into a couple of days, a few days a month. Talk about, talk about an incredible talent. Um, I think that's a really great sell. Now, it may be a harder sell for some of those more traditional high volume MBA employers like consulting firms or the banks that are used to a full-time MBA profile, but we have had MBAs that have transitioned into those organizations too. So I think it's a, I think it's a, an excellent experience for me. One thing just occurs to me is that this talent shortage that we talk about, which I think everyone must be aware of, um, must be affecting them daily. Um, it probably presents uh, opportunity but challenge for you because if people realize that they have to move through their careers faster in order to get to, to, to fill the opportunity of the talent shortage, they may say, well, I, you know, to hell with an MBA, to hell with an MBA. In fact, I'm not even going to bother to graduate. Um, some of them, if they're in technology, that's what they say. Um, now, I suppose many, few people will realize that perspective and you know, then apply it backwards to their career. But do you see that as a threat to um, the business schools, or do you see it as an opportunity because people will say, no, I need that experience quickly, and I better go to business school again? I think there's always going to be a segment of the talent pool that wants to have a business school experience. Mm -hmm. That said, this is precisely one of the reasons that we came up with the Saturday Open Forum. It was for that segment of the pool that really didn't want the opportunity cost of taking time off. They were thinking about a longer term career in the current vertical they were in. And they wanted to come to school, get the degree, but not, mm. not take time off. Um, I would imagine that, that there are plenty of folks that going forward would question you know, if this really value, and that gets back to my point of view. You shouldn't come to business school unless you've done your due diligence and said, here's the expected path that I want to take. And people in that path are much more successful, or they accelerate much more quickly with the degree, with the network. I imagine it must be true that the business schools, uh, I think I know it to be true, Columbia and, and, and a number of the others, that essentially you are acting as a pooling uh, facility, particularly when um, issues of globalization, uh, global candidate pool, and diverse candidate pool are, are being considered. So for gender diversity and for international executives, I imagine that, that that's really one of the roles you see yourselves fulfilling. For sure. I mean, in our in our full time MBA program, uh, clearly a third of the incoming class each year is international, mm -hmm. non US citizens. In EMBA, it's a little bit different. Our New York based program draws heavily from the tri state area, just given the, the format. And so, um, a lot of those students are, are US citizens, the majority, in fact. Mm -hmm. But many of them have actually were born and, and educated outside of the class, but have come here and, and worked for the years. Um, but certainly, think of it as a, as a global talent pool and are trying through the, the educational experience to enhance that talent and make it more marketable. What about the gender balance? Gender balance right now is about 35% of the full-time MBA program is uh, women and 25% in EMBA. Probably a bit lower in EMBA because of the, the average age at which students come in, which is around 31 or 32 for EMBA, which um, for, for some uh, female uh, business people can create some um, timing issues uh, when, when they want um, to, to focus more on personal life. I know we have some time constraints. Uh, Toby, how much longer have we got before you? Five minutes? We, uh, we've got time for another question. Another question? Who's got another question? Yes, please. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, how have you seen like a uh, classic companies that, that recruit MBAs, like financial institutions, like how are they competing with these new hot companies like Google, LinkedIn, much more casual cultures when you can ride a scooter around or a bicycle. I mean, I read an article where, where Goldman Sachs was like really at a loss for for, uh, for MBAs because they were heavily competing with Google. You see uh, American Express changing their, you know, uh, attire policies so you can be more casual at work. You know, I mean, how, what have you seen? In, 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 you know, but well, don't forget, Goldman have just um, allowed and encouraged their interns to take Sundays off. 
We saw in, in the internet room um, the same phenomenon, right, where as all of these, these growth companies were emerging, it was very exciting, very sexy for students, and, and the traditional MBA hire, the high volume acquirers of MBA talent, were, were concerned about this. The reality was that we still had a steady stream of people going to those firms and an ongoing interest. I mean, I think that will always be the case. Yeah, I, I understand why an environment like a Google or, or some of the Silicon Valley based organizations might be exciting to students. Um, I hope it's less about whether or not you get to sit outside under an umbrella and sip free drinks <laughs> at lunch hour or ride a scooter around. I hope it's more about the type of environment and, and the focus of work, the functional work that you want to do, or the, the, the culture, I guess, is a, is a broad term, but just the, 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 the emotional valence of the organization. Um, a lot of those sort of successful startups are, are now maturing. And you can see they brought in leaders from the outside who are... They don't know how to ride scooters. That's right, they don't know how to ride scooters, and, and they don't like drinking at lunchtime. Um, and so, you know, it will always be the case that, that hot, sexy, new opportunities come up, different industries uh, present themselves. I think at Columbia, um, we'll certainly have students that are attracted to those environments, but we'll also have a core of people that are really focused on some of the more traditional, I hate to call them that, um, hires. I think that brings us to uh, a close. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, you. Really appreciate it having you here. Thanks very much.